welcome to the UPS Store live chat to celebrate 3D Print Industry Week. I am Sajal Zaveri, owner of a UPS store in Atlanta. Uh, we are one of 62 locations currently offering 3D print services uh, in the country. Uh, with me today, I have Bob Claggett uh, of I Like to Make Stuff. Thank you for joining us, Bob. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do at I Like to Make Stuff. So um, I have a YouTube channel and okay. a blog, and I like to make stuff. Um, <laughs> I just I make all sorts of different things from different medium. Um, Furniture, software, 3D printing stuff, CNC stuff, just kind of whatever I want to make at the any given day. And um, I make videos about those projects, and I teach people how to make stuff for free. That's fantastic. Well, thank you very much again for joining us today. Yeah. Uh, so tell us something, Bob. Uh, why is 3D printing interesting more now than it was, say, years ago? Obviously, the technology has been around for some time. Why do you kind of think it's been picking up recently? I think uh, it's, it's matured a lot, and it still has a long way to go. But I think in the last couple of years, we've seen it go from something that was happening in really big, expensive machines <laughs> at, at companies <laughs> to something that's happening in homes and in workshops and uh, at schools, things like that. So I think there's a, a few pieces to that that have made it a lot more accessible and, and are getting it into more places. Um, the machines themselves are a lot less expensive than they used to be. They're smaller. Um, a lot of them can be made. You okay. can make your own machine instead sure. of buying your uh, machine. Um, but I think even the bigger thing than that is the software side of it. The yes. software tool chain has changed dramatically in like maybe the last two years. Okay. You used to have to have 3D modeling software that was um, basically the same software they would use to make visual effects for a movie okay. or you, know, you would design a building and you were using those sure. basic same applications to model something small for 3D printing. In the last couple of years, there have been a bunch of new pieces of software that have come out that are geared specifically for modeling something uh, small or something you know that a normal human being would know how to model. Sure. And so you have a lot more options as far as getting into it from the software side of things. And the majority of those things are free, which was not the, the case, case you know several years ago. Yeah, absolutely. So that I think the advancements in software have made it a lot more attainable for a lot wider range of people. And okay. that's why it's more interesting because people are saying it's realistic, you know, that I absolutely. can actually do this where I couldn't two, two or five years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Great points, great points. To all those uh, tuned in, please uh, feel free to submit any questions you have for Bob uh, or myself. We will be taking questions during this live chat. Uh, we'll get started here. Um, Joey's got a question. Uh, can I print large scale projects at the UPS store? The answer to that is absolutely. Uh, though we do have certain size restrictions on the single piece that we can build in our bed, uh, we absolutely, absolutely can print in multiple parts and glue pieces together. Uh, we also have the ability to outsource, if absolutely necessary, to an approved vendor and get you know a single solid large piece if we need it. Uh, have you ever come across you know printing a project in multiple pieces to get it together? I personally have not, but I, I know several people. I'm really into YouTube. I know a lot of other YouTubers. <laughs> I know several people who have printed um, some really large scale projects and they are forced to print them because of the printer that they have available. They're forced to print them in small pieces and glue them together or mechanically bind them together. You know, you make okay. two pieces that lock together or you screw them or glue them. There's a lot of different methods. In fact, I believe the sign was 3D printed and you know, the, that could not be done on a single printer, but sure. it was assembled and uh, I think the results are really nice. So that's a pretty good example of doing something large scale, you know, out of smaller pieces. Exactly. And talking about that, you know, obviously pieces fitting together. At the UPS store, we use the Stratasys Uprint SE Plus machine. It is a professional grade printer. Um, it does have more uh, accuracy for printing uh, dimension wise, especially when you need parts to fit together. And as I'm sure you know, um, it becomes important. So a lot of home printers may not have the ability to print as exact as you might need. But when you're printing pieces that need to fit together similar to what we have here, it does obviously become important, correct? Yeah, definitely. I, I think um, you know accuracy is a big thing. Um, I think it gets bigger the closer you get, or it becomes more important the closer you get to your final product. So okay. You know, if you're, I think if you're working on an idea and you're modeling something, maybe the accuracy isn't as important as you get started. The finish on the product maybe isn't as important as you get started. Okay. But once you get closer to that final piece, yeah. the final, you know, you want to, you want a really nice, finished, accurate model or physical model to use in whatever the, the case may be. I am. Sure. Um, if I can show you it's something I've been working on. Absolutely. Um, so, I found for me, 3D printing didn't really take hold until. I had a specific thing that I had to fix. Sure, a need it. that you had yeah, to. Yeah, a need that I had to solve a problem with. And it was a, a small problem, relatively small. 
So in my shop, I have a, a CNC machine. Okay. And that's a, a computer-controlled cutting machine that can cut wood or metal. Sure. And so you do a design on the computer, and it tells it to cut. <laughs> um, so on this machine, part of moving this, this manually moving this head around, there's a little hex nut on top that you okay. have to manually turn, and it's really uncomfortable on your fingers. It's not really made for that. Okay. And so I found that that was just a tedious little annoying thing that I had to do in my shop every time sure. I wanted to use this thing. <laughs> So that was a good instance for me to uh, look at 3D printing as a way to make a little widget, a little thing to help that make that easier to do. Okay. And the reason I'm talking about this is because of the precision, <laughs> I had to be able to model something that fit around that that little hex nut. Yeah, it had absolutely. To fit, right? Absolutely. So I, t I did a video on this that you can see on my YouTube channel, but this entire process was about 45 minutes, okay. start to finish. Okay. Wow. So I took my machine, I took some digital calipers, and I measured the width and the top and the okay. height of this nut. And I went into some free 3D software and modeled a really simple knob that fit, that had a pocket in it that would fit down okay. over that nut. Okay. So I went from looking at the problem, went right to the software, made a really simple model. And I have very little modeling experience. Okay. Put that out okay. There. Um, and modeled this thing, put it in my printer, yeah. and printed it out. It took about 20 minutes to print, start to finish, 45 minutes. And I ended yeah. up with this little knob with a hex hole in it. Okay. And now this snaps right down over my CNC machine, and now I have a knob that makes it a lot easier to well, turn. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> and that was only possible because yeah. I could get the precision pretty simply that I sure. needed to get on this inside shape. So, so it would fit it, the screw. It would fit like a real world item. You know? Perfect. Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, the precision is, is definitely important, especially if you're interacting with something that's real world. Sure. Um, and in this case, this was something from my workshop. It doesn't okay. have to have particularly nice finish or anything. But if I wanted to sell these at a production level or something, uh, you would want to kind of go to the next step of, pre of precision and finish. OK. So, yeah. Well, good to know. Good to yeah. know. Uh, so we're pulling questions from across social media. Uh, and here's one uh, from Twitter. Uh, this question's for you, Bob. Uh, Anthony asks, is there a place that you go to look for inspiration? Other 3D print resources, blogs? You know, something to kind of generate that. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot. The internet is just packed with um, fantastic resource for this stuff. And um, I found a lot of resource actually outside the internet, um, okay. which is pretty interesting. So on the internet, I think some really good places. Uh, Instagram is just fantastic because people are constantly posting okay. what they're working on. So you get to see things in progress. Sure. So that's sure. motivating yeah. and inspiring. Um, Thingiverse is a really good site for being inspired because it's a repository where somebody can make a model of something yeah. like this, and then they upload that model to okay. Thingiverse. Okay. Other people can download those models and print them out or modify them. So it's good f um, for that because you can actually see the progress of an item over time as it gets in the hands of other people and gets modified and improved. Along those so, lines, have you ever submitted something that you've gotten feedback from the community and made changes to? I have. Um, this, this thing actually went up there. I've got a couple other things up there. And one of the cases about this one, mm -hmm. I put up and said, hey, Take it, yeah. make it better, do sure. whatever you want to with it. And people have actually said, well, you know, on my printer, it doesn't print out quite the same size, so it didn't fit. So I had oh. to modify the, the one that you posted, okay. and then they re-uploaded it so that it fits. And it, that's all based on the specific printer and stuff. Okay. But um, the cool thing there is that somebody actually took it and improved it and made it work for them, and then they put it back up for other people to have. So Great. Thingiverse is really good for stuff like that and for finding um, a very specific piece you know, like if you have if you have a certain brand uh, mixer or something, sure. and you need a knob, there's a kind of good chance you can go there and search for I need this type of mixer somebody's knob, gonna and it. somebody's going to have it. <laughs> and so it's handy for that. Uh, yeah. uh, offline, there's a lot of also, uh, good resources or places for inspiration too. Um, Maker fairs okay. are really big. They're all over the country now, all over the world, really. And um, they're just a big show and tell. So yeah. there's a lot of 3D printing there. People are bringing the printers that they're working on, the projects that they're working on. They're showing off what's possible. Wow. And these are people that are just making new stuff all the time. And sure. it's, it's kind of like the craziest stuff that you can imagine with the 3D printers <laughs> happening and being shown off there. So uh, the maker fairs and then a lot of schools have STEAM nights, uh, okay. which is like a science technology type night. And I, I know my kids, their school has this on a regular basis where they, you get to go and learn about the new technology that's out. 3D that's printing is a big part of that. It is, it is. So absolutely. you got that. And then uh, the last thing that I think is, is kind of local to a lot of people, not everyone, but it's uh, a big point of inspiration and experience is uh, the typical maker space. Yeah. There's maker spaces in a lot of cities where 
It's basically like a gym membership. You go to this place, okay. you get a membership, and you get access to all the tools that they have there to use to make stuff. And right. a lot of times, there's 3D printers there. Those 3D printers are usually run by people who understand how to use them. <laughs> yeah. And so that's a fantastic place to go to say, like, I want to learn about this stuff. I yeah. want to understand you know, what it's capable of. Um, and then you have people there with knowledge that can just show you what it does. Yeah. So there's a ton of resource all over the place, I think, Absolutely. to learn about this stuff. That's great. That's great. So it is, it's, it's not something that's out of reach for even no, your, your, your common consumer, average person that wants to learn some new technology. You know, the yeah. information's out there for them. Yeah, just, and, and for all age ranges. I mean, yeah. there are some uh, design softwares that are geared specifically to kids. Okay. Which is great. Yeah. Because, um, you know, a kid can go drag and drop things rather than having to worry about you know, am I modeling this correctly? <laughs> <laughs> My eight-year-old doesn't care about 3D modeling, but he does think, oh, I can snap these toy pieces together on a screen yeah. and then print out the toy. Absolutely. That's kind of mind-blowing for <laughs> a kid. So uh, so there's that, you know, there's, I think, uh, access and resource for all types of people, all age groups. Great, yeah. great. So we've got another question here from Nitesh. How do you uh, dissolve the pieces? And I think this gets into a little bit of the specifics on the printer that we use at the UPS store. As I mentioned, it is the Stratasys Uprint SE+. Plus. Uh, it is a professional grade printer. Uh, the way our machines work is the, the, the model is built um, on a support base. So first there is a support layer that is built, and above that is uh, modeling uh, material that is used to create the actual product. Now once an object is finished, we set it in a uh, what we call a wash tank. It's got a you know, soluble material, so we put it in the solution, it dissolves away all the support material and you're left with your final product. Um, have, do you encounter something similar in the, in the printers you use, kind of a support and a modeling material combination? Or? Yeah, I, I've actually never used that type of support material. That okay. sounds pretty nice. <laughs> it it <laughs> is, it the, is. The stuff that I've used is, um, is actually printed out of the same material as, as the final print. And okay. so uh, most of the support material that I've used is software generated, so I don't have to manually go in and do it. But when it's printed, I have to go back and cut it away sure. and finish it off. So okay. having it dissolve would be a lot less work. Yes. <laughs> it sounds pretty yes, nice. Yes, it's great. We drop it into a little tank. Uh, it heats up the uh, solution inside the tank. Oh, it, it takes a few hours. It's not something right. that happens you know, immediately, depending on the size and the complexity of the project. But it does. It dissolves away all the support material, and you're really left with just the final piece that, that you had printed. So yeah. um, that's, uh, that's the answer to Natasha's question. To, yeah. the, to the support material, in, in case somebody's not familiar, the reason that you would have support material is if Say I was 3D printing this hand yeah. in this position. Well, the printer can't print uh, these things just hanging out in Correct. the middle of space. And exactly. so it would start printing from the ground up here, and then it would have to create some stuff from the ground up to, to maintain and support these things Absolutely. while it was printing that. And then when it's done, you would trim away this excess stuff underneath. That's, that's, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, that's exactly right, exactly right. Uh, so Haley is asking, uh, what can I print? What types of files do we accept? Uh, how complicated can it be? So honestly, complicated, uh, it's, up to, it's up to you. Uh, it can be as simple or as complicated um, as you like. It depends on how uh, skilled or talented you are at design. Uh, we don't really have any limits on complications. The printer that we use uh, is, takes uh, STL files. Uh, they are created from most AutoCAD programs. Do you use a similar type of file when mm -hmm. you're printing? Yep. Yeah, I, use, I output STL files from uh, everything I use. And I think that's a pretty standard yeah. you know, format that most pieces of software can output. Exactly. So. And, and we can really, I mean, print. There's, there's no limits to what can be printed. Obviously, there are some restrictions. You don't want to print things that you shouldn't be printing. But uh, in, in relation to you know, the, the ideas and the thoughts that I think most consumers have, like you said, a knob to, just, it, it, to fix an everyday issue, right? You can design something. Um, I give you an example. You know, we have blinds at my house, and one of the clips is broken. So I could easily go once I design the file and create a replacement to that. And now, you know, you've been in a house for several years, the manufacturer doesn't make that part anymore, but you can still have a solution to the problem, which right. I think 3D printing definitely allows for. Um, so Leroy is asking um, that, uh, Leroy, you check the map, um, and there isn't a UPS store location near you. That's not a problem. Um, most of our files we accept via email. Obviously, if it's somebody local, we'll, we'll have them bring it over uh, on a thumb drive. But you're more than welcome to find any of the stores that do have the 3D printer. Um, send them a quick email, send them over your STL file. Um, many of the stores have the ability to upload your STL file through their uh, dedicated UPS store website, and, and they'll quote you back a price. And once the product is finished, I mean, we mail it right to you. So really, there's, you know, as, as nice as personal one-on-one -on -one interaction is, um, if you have a need, it can still it can still be met. You know, you don't have to be where you need to be to get your final product anymore. I think that's pretty amazing, to yeah. be honest. I, I mean, 
I was talking to somebody about this recently that it just seems like the future yeah. that I can say, I want a thing and I'm going to send this file to a person that I don't meet and they make the thing and then they mail it back to me in a yeah. short amount of time. That, that it, blows my mind. It's so. crazy. It's Where has the world come to? Yeah. It's, it's quite cool. Uh, Nicole is asking, what is the coolest thing you have ever printed? So, <laughs> I'm sure you've seen a lot more prints. We're, I'm relatively new to the industry, but you've kind of been around for a little bit. So what do you, what do you say is the coolest thing you've seen? Well, I've seen a lot more cool stuff than I've actually printed, okay. so I'll tell you about some of that. Um, one of the, th well, <laughs> cool and complex are two very different <laughs> okay. things. I've seen a lot of really cool things that yeah. are just cool. Um, there's a guy on YouTube, uh, James, and his site is called XRobots, and I can't remember his last name exactly, but he has th fully 3D printed an R2D2, full size R2D2 robot. No kidding. And it's not just a shell of okay. a robot, it's a working, moving robot. That's amazing. And so it's a combination of of this outward framework that was, the entire thing was 3D printed. So okay. um, it's a framework for the legs and the body and the head of this thing, but it's hollow and all the panels are open on the outside. And so over the course of several, like 40 videos or something, okay. he's been creating this structure and then filling in places of that structure with servos and Arduinos and building saws that come out and arms and periscopes and lights and sure. all this crazy stuff and it's just adding and adding and adding but all these mechanisms all the yeah. gears all the slides all the feet and the wheels and the hinges all that stuff is wow. being 3d printed wow and it's amazingly complex yeah um, but he's he didn't start from the beginning and figure all that out yeah he made funny. a framework printed that framework and then within that framework he's building these kind of little modules um, and so it's been really cool to watch the progress on that project. Uh, he has, has a bunch of other projects as well that heavily rely on 3D printing. But it's in, been cool to watch that because he um, gets to build something and try it out, and I'm like, well, this didn't quite fit. Yeah. So you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna change the way I do this moving thing, or the, it needs more gears here, or whatever. Sure. Sure. And so he can iterate on that and change it as it goes. But it's just this really giant, and I'm a huge Star Wars nerd too, <laughs> that helps. But it's this really giant 3D printed thing that's really complex. That's, so, that's amazing. And yeah. you, you mentioned the iterative process. So that is one huge benefit, I think, of 3D yeah. printing, is that you have the ability to make these iterations, these small changes, um, and reprint something you know, without having to send it out to a huge manufacturer or anything like that. It's something that you can do relatively quickly, you know, within your own home if you've got a 3D yeah. printer or if you use a UPS store, resend a file, hey, I made some changes, can you reprint it? Might take a few hours depending on, on the file type. Um, have, you, have you used the iterative process a lot in, in what you do? I have quite a bit. Um, and and I'm, I'm relatively new to this, to be honest. I mean, it's, I'm not a pro, but I'm learning how to, how to take a thing and you know, improve on it over time. So I do a lot of projects in a lot of different medium. Okay. And um, a lot of it's wood, a lot of it's metal. And you can't uncut wood. So <laughs> if you do it once and you do it wrong, <laughs> then you have to start over, yeah. right? So with the 3D printing stuff, it's been, uh, it's been really cool. Let me show you something I made. And I did a video All on this right. as well. This is a ring light for a GoPro, GoPro camera. Okay. And this was, is kind of a prototype. It's not supposed to be a finished product. But um, it's a combination of a 3D printed shell and some electronics in it and then a little knob. And so I can wow. change the brightness of the light. Very cool. And that's for shooting in the dark or, yeah. or whatever. And it was really just an experiment. But to get to where this final product was, I have a whole bunch of different pieces, different iterations of that process. OK. And um, so it started out as this. It was just a ring. And it was the size of the LED ring that I was using. And it was printed in a transparent material just to see if it would work, okay. if it would fit. And then from there, I you know, changed it a little bit. I added a, a lip around it so it would lock down over the LEDs. Okay. And then from there, it was just a matter of, you know, doing these different versions. And they were all slightly different to make place for the wires to come through or make it fit better or to hold, you know, a piece of electronics. Or, and so it was just changing a little small thing, printing it out, okay. changing another small thing, and eventually getting to this final, <laughs> <laughs> this workable one. Sure. Um, that does what I need it to do. And so that was a really interesting process to, to be able to just tweak that model little bits at a time yeah. and, and just be able to add features and improve things and make the fit better and stuff like that over time. And, and that's something that, you know, I couldn't do that easily in wood. Oh, absolutely. Or metal or, you know, most other materials. Um, it would just be too time consuming to recreate that kind of a detail sure. in those materials just to make a small change. Exactly. So, Exactly. Yeah, I think that's a really big benefit. Um, even if plastic is not your final, 
your final material. Yeah. To be able to iterate the design in this this material is pretty amazing. So yeah, I think it's a big benefit to be. It is. It's huge. We, you know, we've done some three um, D print projects for some customers, and we had a gentleman that came in and he had a design in mind, and we connected him with a designer because he he wasn't very familiar with how to design, and his he wasn't really interested in learning how to design or learning how to print. He was wanting the end product. Right. So you know, we connected him with a designer, um, and they went through and designed, and we did about six or seven iterations for him as well. He he get one printed, make a couple of changes, and they'd send it back. Um, you know, and, and he ended up with with a final product that that he loved. And now it's something that if he chooses to take it to a manufacturing, he can take it and you know obviously change materials if he needs to for a final project. But you know he was extremely pleased that the that the, the process was relatively easy. You know he happened to be down the street from us, so you know he would just hop in and say, "Hey, I've got some changes," and you reprint it. And you know making that process easy for him is is you know what what we're here to do. So yeah. definitely helping him bring his vision to light without him having to have the expertise of knowing how to design or print or. Or anything, so that's that's a great example. Thank you. Yeah, three D printing is, um, is kind of means different things to different people. Yeah. In that case, exactly <laughs> yeah. right. Like I like the the playing with the printer and figuring out the technology and finding a you know like finding out which material works better and stuff like that. Some people just want to get to the idea. They want to get yeah. the final product, and the process to get to that is just kind of stuff. And exactly. It's just, it's just something they have to do to get there. And so, it's interesting when you talk to a group of people about three D printing. They're all going to have a different perspective on it from oh, those yeah. different ways. And uh, so there's room, I think, in 3D printing to have like really high-end printers and to have really low-end, uh, you know, cobbled together machines. <laughs> there's all sorts of a range of people and a range of, of opportunity there. Yeah, to get kind of, you can, there's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. So yeah. there's a lot of options out there for anybody that's interested in just jumping in or, again, wanting a final product. And, you know, we talked about finishing again. You mentioned, um, you know, we, we print at the UPS store in, in ABS plastic. It's a great material because you have the ability to paint it or sand it or make some minor changes if the product itself doesn't end up exactly like yeah. you want, but you, a minor edit instead of a reprint, you have the ability to do that in that particular uh, material. You know, the plastic does come in, in several colors and shades that we have, but, you know, if it's, a, if it's a shade that's not available, that doesn't mean you're stuck with one of the other colors because right. the material allows you to paint and finish. Do you, have you done a lot of finishing on any of the stuff that you've created, or do you normally just keep it I, in? I haven't yet, but I, it kind of dawned on me at one point that, like, I was looking, you know, on Amazon or something for all these different color filaments for my yeah. printers, and then it, it hit me, like, <laughs> wait, I can paint this. I, exactly. I don't have to get all these different, you know. And, yeah, that's a huge, once you realize that that's an option, and you know how to, you learn how to finish the surfaces to where it's paintable, and yeah. then, then you're in model-making territory, and you can you can make really precise uh models or, or you know figures or whatever it is you want to make sure and then paint those details in that you may not be able to like physically color in the material and uh, that can take you in the use of 3d printing in an entirely different direction <laughs> you <laughs> yes. know past the prototyping yeah I mean yes. that's when you get into finished product um, you know I make something for my kids I make a an action figure for my kids and yeah. I Take it and get some model paint out and paint the thing, and then they've got like an actual toy, not exactly. just not just like a clear plastic <laughs> thing that looks like a toy, but something they want to play with. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. So yeah, the finishing process um, can be really wide ranging and can go to an entirely different place than just the production end of things. I think. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's see. We've got another question here from Tech Guy, uh, Bob. I think this is going to be in in your kind of hemisphere here. Um, how do you adjust your VREFs to find your sweet spot in your print lines? He's having a little trouble. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be real honest and say I have no idea. Okay, yeah, that makes that, sense. <laughs> there's, I mean, there's a certain level of, of of detail about the technical stuff of prints that I think you get to okay. once you've been doing it long enough. Um, I have been lucky enough to work with the printers that are that have that are dialed in enough that I don't have to get to that stuff yet. Okay, and I think as I get further into it and start to make more complex models, I'm going to have yeah. to figure that stuff out. Sure, but uh, you know. Um, that stuff is down the road. So I, I think people who are just getting into printing don't feel like you have to understand all the little, the Nuance. millions and millions of settings that, <laughs> yes. that are available there around are printing. There, there are quite a few. There are quite a few. It's amazing how you go from 2D to 3D. You add an, an entirely different dimension, but it's like this whole different thing that yeah. can seem overwhelming. But, you know, as you mentioned, there are a few free tools out there that you can practice on, and you don't have to go and invest in a software yeah. for lots of money. You can still kind of practice and get a feel for whether it's something you want to do. And that's one of the big differences between uh, when you talk about like the wide range of cost of printers. Yeah. Um, a, a less expensive printer is going to be more along the DIY end of things. Sure. And part of that is 
you having to configure all the details and the line height that it's printing and all these little things. Sure. Um, you're paying, and a more expensive printer, you're paying for somebody else to do that exactly. stuff. Right? So, exactly. Exactly. Um, that's another one of those points of entry where you have to gauge, like, is it worth me learning that particular setting that he was talking about, or is it worth me, like, being able to print something when I have an idea? Exactly. And those are two very different things, and you just have to decide where you want to be in that, in that gap, and then find a machine or a technology that is at that same place that you want to be. Exactly. Uh, so now we've got a question from Colin. Is there a specific software, now that we were talking about softwares, that you like best for modeling? Is there a big difference between free, like something like SketchUp, versus a paid software, or do you feel like? Um, I think there is a huge difference. Um, but I personally have tried to stay away from the paid software, the expensive ones, simply because in my videos and on YouTube, I'm trying to teach people how to do stuff. Yeah. Trying to make it accessible for people. And so if I go spend you know $2,000 on some crazy expensive software, yeah. Not everybody's going to do that, and exactly. so my education is is lost yeah. there on them. Yeah. And so I'm looking at um, a lot of stuff. SketchUp is one of them, which is a free one that you can download. Um, one Two Three D Design by Autodesk okay. uh, is a good one. That that's what I've been using. That's actually what I used for all of this stuff that I showed. Okay. Um, there's Autodesk has a wide range of free pieces of software that cover the entire gamut of of like tinkering around. Um, the action figure thing yeah. that I was talking about sure. for the kids, that's an AutoCAD product. But they also they go all the way up to high quality machining and CAM okay. CAD software. And so you have a huge range there within Autodesk itself. One, two, three design, Tinkercad is another mm -hmm. one that I've heard a lot, uh, Fusion 360. Okay. Um, and then outside of Autodesk, you have uh, things like Onshape. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of them. And, <laughs> and that's, that's awesome that there are a bunch of them now, a bunch of free options that run the whole spectrum of okay. complexity yeah. and, and what you want to do with them. Um, so yeah, for me personally, I've been using uh, one, two, three D design a lot because it's it seems like a good middle ground there okay. of complexity and, and simple use. And that's for the modeling end of things. Now the second stage of three D printing um, is slicing, and okay. that's where you take a, a a model that you've made, sure. and the software slices it into layers okay. so that it knows how to print a layer at a time. And okay. that's what the slicing software is doing. And so for me, I've been using Cura, which is another free piece of slicing software. Okay. And that combo has, has worked really well for me so far. So that's kind of what I've been showing off on YouTube, those two things together. And great, work. great, great. All right, the next question comes from Better on TV one Bob, what is the strongest material to use and differences between materials available? Ooh. Well, there's a huge range of materials, so I'm not sure that I could say which is the strongest. Okay. But I think, um, and I'm sure someone will correct me because I, I'm not, I don't know all the details <laughs> here, but I think the actual material has, is, is part of strength. Okay. But I think more important to strength is this, the internal structure within okay. an object. So Absolutely. Um, do we have, yeah, let's show. Yeah. So this is something you guys printed at the store. Yes, correct. And this is kind of a good um, example also of the parts fitting together. This yeah. was obviously too large to print as one, so we printed it in two pieces um, in, the, in, in our printer and able to fit them together so it looks like a whole piece. And right. you know, if, if we wanted as a final product, we could glue them together. The material is very um, good at gluing and painting and finishing like we had talked about. But Yeah, so in this thing, I mean, you can't tell this online, <laughs> but this is actually pretty heavy. Yes. And that's because internally, um, it's not solid. Most of these things are not solid, but they have a structure built into them to give them mass and to make them strong. And and sometimes that's made out of a, a hexagon pattern. Sometimes okay. like a honeycomb. Sometimes it's made out of uh, you know just a grid. But the type of structure on the inside and the density of that structure yeah, has absolutely. a lot to do with how how easily you could crush this with your hand or yeah, how hard you could hit, hit it on it. the table or something like that. So. Yeah. I'm sure one of the plastics that's available is more is stronger than the others, but I don't think that's the big factor in strength. I think mostly it's about the internal kind of integrity of the structure. So the build and the design yeah. of the file as opposed to just the final product. And yeah. and yeah, density is, you know, definitely in, but at least you have the ability to create obviously as you're going through the iterations to make something, you know, start off maybe making more of a shell right. and then getting denser as you get to a final product. So you're not necessarily spending on the materials and all from, from the first stage yeah. until you kind of realize what it is that you want the final output to be. 
Great. Um, so Nick uh, Massaro, I'm sorry if I messed that up, he asks, uh, how do you think 3D printing can help an everyday person? So I think you gave a good example of the knob that you printed <laughs> uh, for your machine. But, but obviously, you're, you're a worker, and you, know, you, you build things with your hands, and, and you're, that's what you do. You're very good at it. But for just like the average consumer, I mean, do you, do you feel like there's a, a fit for, for the average consumer in this kind of market? Or they can get some benefit out of, of what 3D printing can offer? I think there is. I think it's harder to imagine what that would be. Like most tools, I've found, it's harder to imagine what you would use something for if it's at a distance. Yeah. And so if you have uh, the tool in front of you and you start to play with it and see what it's capable of, at least for me, that's when my mind starts going, oh, I could use it for this, yeah. and I could use it for that. And, I could, and, and that's exactly the way I was with 3D printing and with CNC work, and I have a laser cutter coming soon. Nice. And I'm the same way. I don't know what I'm going to do with that yet. <laughs> but as soon as I have it in front of me, yeah. that's when I'm going to start going, oh, OK, yes, I know that it can do this thing. And I'll start finding reasons to use, to use it. it. And so I think 3D printing is kind of the same way. And that doesn't mean that you have to go out and buy a printer and like set it on your desk and <laughs> hope you come up with something <laughs> to do with it. Sure. But I think you know, being exposed to uh, the capabilities, you'll start, to, you'll start to solve problems in your mind with the technology that's at hand. So I think. You know, specifically, probably, um, like you mentioned, the clip yeah. or the things exactly. like that, fixing um, stuff that you can't easily replace but is not complex. There's a lot of that in appliances or like knobs that fall off and sure. crack. Or yeah. um, <laughs> even in my, my car, the air conditioning vent, one of the little tab that you hold yeah. to move the vent sure. is gone. <laughs> <laughs> My kid swallowed it or something. I don't know, but it's not there. Okay. And so that would be a thing that I could easily model yeah. with zero experience. I could sure. easily model a little thing, stick it on there, and then now I can move the AC vent. Yeah. So you know, once you realize that you can create some little stuff, sure. Then you start finding uh, ways to use that. Yeah, like you said, I think the more you you do it, then you start to see the things that you never paid yeah. attention to before. Right. And it's like, oh wait, I can do that. Whereas before, like the, with your your blinds, yeah, you've been like, just oh well, gonna, whatever, they're, they're broken. They're broken. <laughs> we'll just live with it. I'm gonna go buy some new blinds. Exactly, so, yeah. exactly. Um, we've got a question from Sherman Waters. Does the UPS store print in a certain orientation um, as dictated by the STL file, or do we print them in the best orientation? So this kind of goes both ways. We do have an auto orient feature that we like to use. Uh, we also like to find out what the need is from the customer for that particular file. That does. Um, obviously determine how the layers are built and how the integrity of a particular piece is. So we don't always use the best um, orientation as dictated by the software. We will try um, and, and find out what the final use is before we, we print it. Uh, have you found orientation differs? Like Yeah, it, it's a huge thing because specifically on, on these, um, so if I were to print, try to print it this way, then I would have to create support material under all this stuff. And okay all of this vertical stuff is not going to be as supported. You know, sure. It's just going to print straight up, so it's kind of thin. And if I were to print like this, it's going to have to create support material under here. Yeah. It's just a big pain to remove all that stuff. If I print this way, everything is from the ground up, and everything okay. is working straight up, sure. except for this one little section right there. Yeah. So that's really easy to trim off. Exactly. In fact, I could just make that go all the way down to the, to the table, and it'd be fine. So orientation has a, a big effect on the amount of support material you have to remove, okay. which then leads into how long it's going to take, take to, to print, print. Yep, absolutely. Um, how much material you're going to use, the weight of the overall thing, the cost of the overall thing. So orientation's <laughs> pretty important. Pretty important. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, OK, uh, we got a, another question uh, from Sherman Waters. What designers are used with the UPS store? Are there approved vendors? So absolutely. Uh, Designer-wise, uh, the, the stores have access to um, designers, either be it locally, they might have somebody that has the skill set to design in 3D on staff, or they may have contracted out to designers they've worked with that do have the ability to print. Um, as opposed, as in regards to approved vendors, uh, Stratasys definitely is one of our biggest approved vendors. Any project that we get in house that would be too big for us to do, um, or if it's a piece that it's, it's, it's a big solid piece, but somebody doesn't want it broken up into multiple pieces, we can send out to Stratasys and have them print for us, um, and we would you know coordinate all that between the customer um, and the vendor. So for the customer, it's still send us your file. We'll figure out the best way to get it done to meet your needs, and and we'll get it taken care of. Um, a couple of questions about pricing here. So for Bob, uh, Hugger P asks, what did the original ring of your GoPro project cost approximately? Ooh, that's pretty tough. Um, you know, I'm really not sure because I printed it on different printers with different materials. Okay. Um, so I have uh, a filament-based 
printer, a couple of them, and then I also have an SLA printer, which is a stereolithography printer, and that uses a different type of material okay. altogether. So um, I would say the final, like a single piece of this is probably in the hundredth of, hundredth of a cent to okay. cost, I mean, wow. uh, to print. Sure. Because there's nothing to it. Yeah. There's no mass to it at all. <laughs> it's basically hollow. There's nothing, because I wanted light to be able to come through. So I intentionally didn't make it dense. Sure. Um, but then when you, you talk about something that's going to be a little more, has to, it has to be able to hold some weight, um, the cost is going to go up. And, and that's kind of a hard question to answer because, you know, these two filaments would be purchased from different companies with different prices. They may sure. be different types of plastic. Some yeah. plastics have things added to them to make them stronger or glow in the dark or whatever. <laughs> and so there's a huge uh, variety of, you know, how how much material you use in a print sure. and where that material comes from. And um, so it's kind of a hard one to answer. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of, I mean, it, the same goes for the UPS store. So we are kind of unique to, it's on a, it's on a per project basis. So, right, um, you know, for example, something like the femur bone, probably, you know, 300, $350. And it's, it's more, you know, not necessarily the size of it, but the mass and the density and the amount of material that's going in to create that. Now we have something like, uh, like the hand here, which is um, a lot more intricate. It's got a lot more detail. Um, it's got mass. Now, you know, it may look, smaller than the femur, but cost-wise could be more just because of the amount of material that's required um, to build it. But, you know, and again, we get back to if you're going to that iterative process, you can start with something that's not as dense, so you're not spending as much money up front, getting kind of the shell of what you need, and then you can, you know, kind of add to the density on the inside as you design it. That's not the case always. Um, obviously, there are instances where you have to build know, fully from the beginning. But uh, but every project um, is unique, and, and, and the cost varies you know, from, from project to project. Okay, um, uh, let's see, Vicky's asking, is it best to model from the get-go in 3D rather than stage conceptually in 2D? I would say um, I start everything in 2D. Okay. I start everything on paper. Um, you know, and everybody has a different design process for sure. But I've found, because I work in multiple medium, I work in, you know, wood and metal and plastic and acrylics and whatever I can get my hands on really. Sure. Um, so I've found that when I'm making a project and it's going to include multiple things, multiple types of materials, if I start on paper, I start to be able to solve some of the problems ahead of time. And the way I look at a project of any kind is that the project is one big problem. Okay. That problem is made up of a whole bunch of small problems. And so as you start solving those small problems, you start to fix the overall thing. And that's how sure. you get your design done. And when you're solving those small problems, sometimes you can say, well, I need to be able to, to make something like this. I can't do that in wood. So that part has to be 3D printed. Okay. Or this thing has to be so strong because it has to hold this. So that needs to be metal. So I think on paper, you get to solve a lot of that stuff before you start cutting or making yeah. or whatever. Um, so I think paper is still really good for that. Some things will have to be pushed into the digital okay. design sure. area. Um, I mean, I couldn't fully do that on paper and yeah. transfer that to the printer somehow. <laughs> so I have to be able to get there eventually. But I think by being on paper ahead of time, mm -hmm. I knew that I was going to have to come up with a way uh, to hide these wires. And I knew I was going to have to be able to, uh, you know, mount this little circuit board. And those to those things that I just figured out on paper rather than in the design software. Yeah. Um, so I think there's always space to start on paper. and Start in 2D, get your problem solved that you can, you know, kind of pre-problem solve. Yeah. And, and then move on from there. That's how I do it. Excellent, excellent. Now you talked about, obviously you do a lot of woodworking, so <clears throat> when we talk about mixed media, do you have any projects that you do or are currently working on that do include a combination of 3D print with another material or do you work kind of independently with both of them right now? Uh, so far everything's been pretty independent, but I'm, I'm in the process of trying to work some stuff together. One of the things I'm really interested in is embedding plastics, like okay. 3D printing stuff, into natural materials. Okay. So, um, a lot of times you'll see wood inlay on a really fancy piece of furniture. You'll see yeah. one type of wood inlaid in another type of wood. Well, I think that can be done with plastics okay. uh, very easily into wood, especially when you're when talking about digital design. So if I have a CNC machine, the machine that cuts into mm -hmm. wood, I can create the design on the computer and have the, con the computer controls that machine and cuts that very precisely into the material. Okay. I can take that same design and send it to a 3D printer and print, instead of cutting out the negative, I yeah. can print the positive. positive. Okay. And then I can embed that positive down into the wood or other material. And then from there, um, I think it can get really interesting because <laughs> then, then you have these like two materials that shouldn't really go together. They shouldn't bond, they shouldn't fit. 
and you can come up with some really cool inlays yeah. and, and ways for them to work together. And one of the things about, even though it's digital and they should theoretically fit together <laughs> because it's the same digital file, sure. they may not always. But okay. the cool thing about a lot of these plastics is that it's just heat mm -hmm. that makes them be able to come out of a printer. So if, if I was inlaying this into a cutout in wood and it didn't quite fit, I could sand it or I could use a heat gun or mm -hmm. something like that to soften it just enough to get it to fit in there. Oh. And then you're talking about getting like really precise, really nicely fitting pieces. Absolutely. Um, that, you know, if you were doing two pieces of wood and you cut something too small, yeah. sorry about your luck. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I think there's some really cool opportunity to mix um, 3D printing and woodworking in that way. And, and that's something I've been working on behind the scenes, but I haven't released okay. anything about that yet. So, okay. yeah, I think there's options there. There's, there's a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Endless, endless world. Um, okay, so now we've got uh, two, uh, well, Vicki asked another, well, we just asked that question. So two questions from Hugger P. What are the size restrictions for the UPS printers? And is ABS the only material that UPS uses? So the size restrictions for us on a single solid piece built at once, um, our bed is eight inches by eight inches by six inches. Um, so that anything that fits into that dimensions, we can we can print as a solid piece. There's no gluing, there's no fitting together. Uh, but that's not a, that's not really a restriction for us. If you've got something that needs to be printed larger, obviously print in multiple pieces like this did, um, you know, and and fit the two pieces together. Uh, gluing is a great option um, with this particular material. It, it glues, it, it, it holds together uh, very nicely. So size, there's not really a restriction. Really, anything that you've got in mind, uh, we can find a way to print it. Um, as for the material, ABS plastic currently is the only material that we print in-house. Um, again, that's not to say that we're restricted to just that. If, they're, if the uh, customer's got a request for um, a product, you know, you've got multiple things that you've printed here. We do have vendors that we can use to outsource um, if there's a need for um, a a material outside of plastic. Do you mostly print in some sort of plastic right now? Mostly, yeah. Um, I've wanted to experiment with some of the other stuff. There's some wood fill and metal fill um, things that are interesting. But one of the cool things about ABS that you guys print with is that, so some of these are PLA, which is a different type of plastic. Okay. PLA is a little bit harder to finish. Okay. And it doesn't really bond to itself. I couldn't really solvent weld these two together. Okay. ABS, you can. So if I wanted to, for some reason, glue that on there, that would <laughs> yeah. be pretty easy to do. Exactly. And, um, and you can sand it really well. You can finish it a lot. You can get a better overall finish on yeah. ABS than you can get with some of the other stuff. Or, or it's easier to get a good finish on ABS. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I print in, in mostly plastics uh, so far, just kind of bare PLA and ABS. Sure. But I've had better final results, I think, with the ABS. With the ABS plus. Putting in the extra work to do the finishing. So. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Nick Ferry asks, uh, Bob, what is the favorite hey, thing Nick. you have ever 3D printed? Hmm. <laughs> Nick's a friend of mine. Hey, Nick. Ah. Um, <laughs> You know, I think, honestly, I think this thing, and not because it's cool, <laughs> not because it actually solves any problems or anything, just because it was something that I thought of in my head and said, like, I'm not even going to go look on the internet to see if this exists, because okay. it doesn't matter. Sure. I'm not going to sell it. I'm not trying to make a new product. It's a thing that I, I could, I came up with in my head and thought, it's going to integrate 3D printing. It's going to force me to learn some software. Okay. It's going to force me to work around two real world objects. The GoPro mm -hmm. and the circuit board that has to fit on there. Okay. Um, and so it, it was a combination of like, I'm going to be forced to learn this. I'm going to have to fit these requirements. Sure. I'm going to, you know, all this stuff. And it forced me down a road of having to, to solve problems that I'd never had to solve before. Yeah. And it worked. <laughs> but hey. And that made me really like it. You can't beat that. Yeah. Um, so, and like I said, I'm relatively new to this. So I don't have tons of experience. I don't have tons of stuff that I can show about that I've printed. Um, but having a thing that was start to finish, my idea, uninformed from sure. anything else, yeah. uh, that was pretty gratifying. Oh, to, yeah, you know. absolutely. To, to know that you can create something that's functional and useful and, yeah. you know, you did it on your own. Absolutely. That, that, that says a lot. Um, and it's, it's kind of, I think, like you said, it just it makes you feel good. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's the inventor mentality. It you is. Know? Absolutely. If somebody has an idea, you can go start to finish and, and do the whole thing and then print it out. And it exists all of a sudden. That's yeah. pretty amazing. It is. Absolutely. Uh, Linda is asking, how much of what you do is original? Um, hit it on the first try versus trial and error. <laughs> uh, none of it is hit it on the first try. Say that right out of the way. Um, in fact, most things are like this, where I have an idea, uh, kind of the simplest idea possible. I start there and then find the problems and, and make them better and try yeah. to do it over time. You know, if you watch my videos, you'll see that in just about every video I show a mistake. 
And um, people respond to that. And the reason I do that is because it's the truth. It's yeah. real. Like, I don't, I don't make things perfectly. Of course. I, I make stuff, and it breaks or it goes wrong, and then I have to show how to fix that problem. Sure. I think anybody that says that they make things for a living and don't run into those problems <laughs> is probably trying to just make themselves look better. <laughs> um, so I run into that all the time. And I think that's part of growing, part of learning to do your craft, whatever your craft is better, is doing it um, in a way that is out there. Uh, and when you fail, you are you don't just like give up and walk away. Like, yeah. I'm done with 3D printing now because exactly. that didn't work. No, you say, OK, I'm going to make the change that needs to be made to make that thing better. Exactly. And, um, and that's just part of my process. And, yeah. and I don't look at those many failures as failure. They're just. Um, forcing me to learn something new or yeah yeah fix and it, something and it's great to have the ability to iterate right there yeah you know you yeah. see it right away and it's not like you have to fix it and send it off you kind of okay well i'm going to go ahead and fix this you kind of have that you know that push to say okay I, I, this didn't work but i can go ahead and fix it right, right now and try again yeah. and the idea of you know i don't know 10 20 years ago or something of saying like i want to make this thing and i'm going to call someone in another country and hope that they understand Same what way. I mean by that yeah. and that they make it the right way and then exactly. they're going to send it to me months later and then I'm going to see that it's wrong. That sounds awful. <laughs> it does. But, but to be able to have an idea, do it, fix it, do it, fix it over and over and over yeah. and get to where you want to be in a yeah. day. Yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, it is. It's pretty amazing. Um, we've talked about stuff with moving parts. <clears throat> have you ever created anything with moving parts or... Most of your stuff is solid because I think a lot of people associate, you know, we see solid pieces with right. 3D print, right? Everything looks right. like it's just one whole piece. And, you know, what if somebody needs something with moving parts? Is that, you know, obviously at the UPS store, we, we do have that ability. And I'll show a couple of things here. But I want to ask, have you printed anything that's got moving parts in it? Or I'm not there yet. I'm okay. working on some stuff um, that I'm not ready to show yet. But, <laughs> but, yeah, I'm working on that. And that's a new, that's like a whole another step past this of solving problems because, then you have mechanical problems that you're trying to solve. Sure. Like how do you get gears to fit together? And how do you get things to slide smoothly along surfaces? And, um, and I've taken a lot of, of tidbits from the guy I was talking about that was making sure. the R2-D2 because yeah. that's like just full on mechanics. There's tons of moving parts there that have to fit and work together. And so I'm learning a lot from watching people like him who are trying and iterating and all that stuff. And so, yeah. no, I'm not, I don't have anything there yet, but it is really interesting uh, yeah. to be able to, to step past static stuff and exactly. move into mechanical stuff that's being printed. I sure. Think that's cool. um, an example is, you know, obviously this the, the chain is something that we print. Um, you know, it, we, this was printed at the UPS store. Um, it prints in a solid piece. There's there's nothing. You know, it's not, you know, 50 different things that we put together. It prints in a solid piece. Um, after the soluble material is dissolved away, you have a moving a moving part, similar to kind of uh, this phone case, right? So you've got the gears that. Um, that move and you know this wasn't printed in multiple uh, pieces it was one solid piece it was just designed so that the gears um, you know obviously can move um, within each other and um, it's it's really cool to see that, that you've got the ability to print things that can have movement as opposed to just something that's solid and you know that is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's very cool. <laughs> it's, I would love to be able to get to that. It's, yeah. it's, it's a nifty, it's a nifty thing. Um, okay, uh, we've got two questions from Patrick's workshop. Uh, what chemical hey, can Patrick. you use to vapor the PL PLA? And uh, what are some of the limitations of 1.8 degree steppers versus 0.9 when using it for an extruder? Ooh, uh, the stepper question, I don't really have a good answer for that. Okay. Um, hmm. I'd have to think about that. I don't have an answer there. Okay. As far as the other one was about the vapor, uh, yeah, PLA. Yeah, use, uh, what chemical can you use to vapor the PLA? So there's a lot of discussion online about this. And I've seen a few options, but I don't want to say them because I'm not entirely sure that they're safe. OK. Um, so when you use ABS, you can use um, acetone, I okay. believe, to, to be able to smooth the surface. You can do a bath, or you can do vaporing. And that's just putting it in the vapor and letting the vapor like smooth, physically smooth out the surface. OK. Um, so with PLA, it's a different type of plastic, different you know properties to it. And so you have to use a different chemical. I've seen some options, but it seems like every time somebody says, I've got the solution to smooth PLA, yeah. somebody else steps in and goes, no. you're going to kill yourself, or <laughs> you're going to hurt someone, or yeah, something like that. So you have to good. be really careful okay. when you're um, dealing with chemicals in regard to changing other chemicals. Yes. <laughs> so I don't really want to say what those options are, but I think there are some things that are being experimented out there uh, with. and. I'm sure you could find some insight. 
I okay. did some research. Good to know. Uh, so we're getting close to the end of our um, hour here. Please, you guys uh, submit any uh, final questions. We've only got a few minutes left. Uh, Luke asks, what does the future of 3D printing look like? So what are, <laughs> what are your thoughts? Of Let me tell you exactly <laughs> what it looks like. I have no idea what it looks like. But I think that's the cool thing about it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's come a really long way in a couple of years. I mean, it's, it's been moving for a long time. I don't want to sound like it's all happened in two years. Yeah. But I think the last couple of years, you've seen big steps forward in all those things that I talked about earlier. And so I think as, as the software and the machines and just the general understanding of it get more and more embedded into like our daily lives and my kids are growing up with knowledge, full knowledge of 3D printing. Absolutely. Um, you know, where it can go from here and what it's gonna be, I have no clue. Because yeah. those, my kids are the ones who are gonna be taking it there, sure. you know, in the future. Sure. So I think there's this, there's a certain group of people, a certain mentality that say like, in a few years, everything's gonna be 3D printed. Like this computer, 3D printed, <laughs> this table, 3D printed. Yeah. That's a great idea, but it's totally unrealistic because yeah. plastic can't be everything. And even once you get to where you're printing metal someday or something, yeah. Yeah. it's still not gonna be able to solve every problem. I do think it's gonna become a much bigger part of our daily uh, lives and of local manufacturing. Sure. That's a really big opportunity hmm. to where you could be like the clip that you were talking about. Rather than hoping that there's a warehouse somewhere that so-and-so manufacturer has that clip in, yeah. There, you know, you can have local manufacturing hubs that can just produce all this stuff for you that you would have to wait to order somewhere or something. Sure. There's a lot of opportunity for uh, stuff that is right now really distributed okay. to be localized um, by 3D printing. And that's pretty exciting. I don't really know what that's going to look like, but I think there's yeah. a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, that. absolutely. And I think as, as, as people get more educated and, and, and more familiar with, with the design process of um, 3D printing and, and being able to create these digital files for what they want to print, you know, the limitation is really only as far as you can do. So right. the more you can do, the more things you can create, the more things you can print. And it might be something for fun, you know, a little you know, figurine that you want to keep on your desk, or it might be something functional like a doorknob or a, yeah. you know, something that's absolutely useful. So I definitely think that, that the, the possibilities are endless. Uh, you know, like you said, not necessarily in every you know, area of what we do, traditional manufacturing still is going to, you know, override yeah. some of those things. Yeah. But definitely, I think the potential is just, it's, it's getting better and better. And if you look at like my, so when I look at my nieces and nephews who are, are now, you know, in high school and college and stuff, when they were kids, um, computers were available for them to be able to create graphics and video stuff, sure. whereas I was a kid, that wasn't there. Yeah, absolutely. And they're now in a totally different place in college and high school than I was at exactly. that time. So when I think about my kids who are very young um, being exposed to 3D modeling at you know a very young age like where are they going to be when they're in high school and college and it's not just my kids it's a it's, generation a yeah. uh, worldwide generation of kids that, that are exposed to this stuff it's going to go places we can't even imagine absolutely and i think you see and you hear a lot about schools that are starting to invest in 3D technology yeah. and teaching kids at an earlier age of the possibilities and what they can do and you know, there's a lot of robotics groups and programs out there for kids to be a part of and right. kind of get their hands on modeling and printing now so just like you said i mean they're they're already learning it so for them it's it's going to be you know just part of education for them they know how to do it yeah. so Excellent. Uh, so Woodworking Maniac asks, Bob, know him too, anyway. <laughs> what is the most useful thing that you have printed on the fly to fix a problem in the moment? Um, pro well, this, <laughs> <laughs> back to this, um, this knob was really helpful and, and it doesn't seem like a big problem the way I described it. And it's not a big problem, but it was a little thing in my shop that made my shop a little bit more efficient. Okay. And this is one example of this type of thing. I've done a few other knobs and shims to fit under things. I have certain machines in my shop that take small SD cards and you can't get your finger into yeah. them. And so I make little grabbers that can grab the SD card and pull them out. It's in my case, it's a lot of really small things just to get the annoyances out of the machines that I have to use. Sure. And, um, which, doesn't sound like a big deal, but when I'm on a schedule trying to produce a video, you know, every week or so, and I'm trying to design and and make and video and edit and all that stuff, <laughs> yeah. those five seconds of having to do this annoying little thing, you know, they add up to being Absolutely. You know, a, a time deficit. So things like this, being able to fix small things on the fly um, of all different types has been really beneficial for me. Yeah. So, I don't know that I have one answer for that, but a lot of this <laughs> stuff one, is very handy. That, one's, yeah. that was a good one. That was a good one. Um, okay, Amy's asking, uh, how long does it take to 3D print something? 
Um, no good answer there either. Yes. Because um, it depends a lot on, like we said before, the, the infill in these objects. You know, if this is basically solid, that's going to take a lot longer than if it's basically hollow. That's correct. correct. Um, the overall size has a lot to do with it. The amount of support material that it has to also print to be able to support the thing has a lot to do with it. Um, and then another thing is, is precision. If you slow the machine down, sure. it will have a more precise layer that it can create. Yeah. And so that's going to obviously take, take a lot time. longer. If you just want something rough and dirty and it doesn't have to have a nice finish on it, you can make the layers thicker. And that's going to make it go faster, but it's yeah. not going to look as nice. Exactly. So there's a lot of variables there for. Yeah, yeah, we've we've kind of come across the same thing. I mean, we've we've had um, stuff that's taken you know 10, 15 minutes to print small plastic parts, replacement parts that consumers have needed, um, or we've had you know so, like something like this, which took several hours to print just because of the density involved um, in what was to print. So I think it is like you said, it's totally dependent on the object and the amount of material that goes inside of it to kind of determine um, how long it takes to to complete it. Yeah. Uh, Curtis Rose uh, is asking, is the UPS store equipped with scanning capabilities to scan objects to reprint them? So we don't currently have scanning uh, machines uh, located inside the store. Uh, again, we do have resources that we can reach out to if somebody has something that needs to be scanned um, and then they want to you know, reprint based on a scan. The resources are available, just not physically located inside the store. Have you ever scanned something and printed? I have played around with some of the, uh, there's some apps that you can get for your phone okay. or for tablets um, that will do that to a degree and I've played with them and it seems yeah. really interesting, <laughs> okay. but I have not successfully scanned something yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So uh, I think you know we've, we're kind of approaching the end of our time here. Um, just just as a recap, we've kind of gone through um, the iterative process that 3D printing really is beneficial for. Uh, Bob had a great example here. Um, also, you know the future of 3D printing. It, uh, the possibilities really are endless. It, it, it really depends on on where your imagination takes you, um, and what you need, and you know what you have a need for. Uh, and, and like he mentioned, there's a lot of free softwares available out there, so you're not limited to, it's not really a cost, it's not really a barrier of entry right now, at least not in the design perspective. If you want to get out there and you know, try your hands at designing, the tools are available, resources are available um, to, to let you practice that. And of course, if you just want the end final product, you know, we're happy to, to connect you with a designer um, and get your, get your idea into a digital file um, and, and print it. Um, we are headed to the uh, i3DP conference in Santa Clara tomorrow. Uh, we'll continue to field your questions there. You tweeted uh, questions, hashtag 3DP week. Um, thank you, Bob, very much for, for coming out and giving us some of your yep. insight on what you've done. Um, definitely follow the UPS store, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Follow Bob at, you know, I like to make stuff. Yeah, and, I like to make stuff.com has okay. everything. Um, you can have a YouTube channel, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all the stuff. Okay. So it's Great. basically, I like to make stuff on all the different platforms. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in, and we hope to hear from you guys later on this week. 3D Print Week is going on for the UPS store from now until Friday, so feel free to, to chime in on all the social platforms and see what else we have going on. <laughs>